So I, uh, I want to thank Saman for that uh, very interesting introduction. <laughs> of all the introductions that I've had, that is definitely the most recent. So thank you. Um, and I also want to thank uh, all of you for coming today. I see a number of former students here, and uh, we know how busy you are. Uh, this is a very uh, a special time for us that you're um, able to join us. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is a rather strange topic. Um, the title uh, is um, Can Financial Engineering Cure Cancer? And you know, you should be suspicious when academics start their talks with a question, because that usually means that they don't have an answer. <laughs> and um, it, it, that's true in this case. Uh, the short answer is, I don't know whether financial engineering can cure cancer, but, but I, I think the answer is going to be yes. And we need your help to figure that out. And in, in the end, I'll explain to you why. Uh, this, by the way, is uh, in collaboration with my co-authors, uh, David Fanyan, Jose Maria Fernandez, and Roger Stein. And let me tell you how I got interested in this topic. Um, it's really for personal reasons. Over the last few years, a number of friends and family have been afflicted with cancer, as with many of you, I suspect. And so in dealing with them and their situations, uh, it became uh, pretty clear to me that there are some very strange things going on, not only in the, uh, uh, the drug development uh, area, but also in the financing uh, and the, the business aspects of the pharmaceutical and biotech industries. And uh, after learning more about the business, I came to a rather difficult conundrum that took me a, a while to even come up with a conjecture as to how to resolve it. And I want to tell you what that conundrum is. Over the last decade, we've made tremendous breakthroughs in our understanding of the molecular basis of disease. Uh, for example, in 2001, Novartis introduced a revolutionary drug called Gleevec. This is the first in an entirely new generation of so-called designer drugs that were developed from the ground up, from the basis of the molecular biology of the disease, leukemia. And for a number of people, this was a lifesaver. It literally transformed a death sentence to a chronic manageable condition. In 2004, another drug of that kind, Avastin, was introduced, which basically inhibited the growth of blood vessels in tumor cells. And in 2008, the Genome Institute at Washington University sequenced the first cancer cell, leukemia. But probably the most significant of all of these developments occurred just last year with a particular individual by the name of Dr. Lucas Wortman. Uh, Dr. Wortman, when he was a graduate student, developed leukemia, a particularly nasty form of leukemia known as acute lymphoblastic leukemia. This kind of leukemia kills in a matter of weeks and months. You don't have years and years, as with some other forms of leukemia. And so at the time when he developed this, they uh, did a standard treatment of chemotherapy. And for a while, the chemotherapy seemed like it worked until there was a recurrence of this leukemia at which point they gave him a bone marrow transplant from his brother. And he was a medical student at the time, and so he was able to continue on with his medical studies and graduated, and then got a job at Washington University's Genome Institute. And while on the job, he developed a second recurrence of leukemia. And at that point, he started putting his affairs in order and saying goodbye to his friends, because the survival rate for somebody with the first time recurrence of acute lymphoblastic leukemia is about 5%. We don't have statistics on a second recurrence because it's so rare that, that you ever get to that point. Well, his friends were researchers at that Genome Institute. They decided not to take things lying down. So over the course of several weeks, they decided to put out an all, all uh, uh, effort to try to save their friend 24-7. Uh, no holds barred. They tried everything that they could to figure out what was wrong. They sequenced his DNA. They sequenced his tumor cells' DNA. They sequenced the RNA of the leukemia cells. And they found a particular gene that was overexpressed. And then they're using high throughput screening methods. They identified an approved drug that was able to suppress that gene. It was a drug called Sutent, which is not approved for leukemia. It's a kidney drug. They gave it to him, and after a few weeks, he was fine. He recovered, and he went back to his job. And after a few months, they could no longer detect any leukemia cells in his body. 
for all intents and purposes, he was cured. Now, oncologists will never say cured because cancer can mutate and come back uh, even years later. But as of 2012, uh, he was actually just fine. And it was such an impressive achievement that it made the front page of the science section of the New York Times last July. What's most incredible about this was that in that same year, last year, another fellow, this time somebody in New York, also developed acute lymphoblastic leukemia and was cured of the disease in a completely different way, using immunotherapy, using the individual's own immune system. Same disease, cured in two different ways, and it would have been uh, a death sentence otherwise. So what's the conundrum? Well, the conundrum is that over the last 10 years, if you look at the investment rate of return of the biotech and pharma industry, it's been remarkably mediocre. The NYSE ARCA Pharma Index from 2002 to 2012 has a compound annual rate of return of minus 1%. And the IRR of biotech VCs during that same period was about the same, it was minus 1%. In fact, the last good year for biotech was 2000 where they had a fantastic IRR, but since that time, it's gone down almost monotonically year by year by year. And the returns have been so off-putting that this last year, PricewaterhouseCoopers showed that money was leaving the space in droves. In fact, the number of biotech startups is the lowest in 2012 that it's been since 1995. How is that possible? How is it possible that we've gotten so much smarter about diseases like cancer, and yet during that same period of time, investors have not been able to earn a decent rate of return. There seems to be something wrong with this picture. And the fact that we are actually taking money out of the space, both in public and private investment vehicles, seems to be completely counterintuitive. Now is a time when we ought to be investing to be able to get over this threshold of understanding the nature of disease. Well, there are a couple of different uh, possibilities, but let me give you one rather counterintuitive conjecture about why this is going on. My co-authors and I, we think that the reason that this rate of return has been so lackluster is because the business model of the biopharma industry is broken. And in particular, it's broken in the sense that as we get smarter in this business, the risk has actually gone up. Now, for a finance person, that's totally counterintuitive. Typically, you think that as you get smarter, as you learn more about an investment, you're reducing the risk, right? But it turns out that for drug development, it doesn't quite work that way. And here's one reason why, very simple reason, simple caricature. In the old days, when we developed a drug, we would take a compound, try it out on all the patients that have the disease, and maybe it helps 10% of them, maybe it kills 1% of them, and that's a good drug, and you get it approved and you put it on the market, and everybody that has the disease has to buy the drug. Well, nowadays, we have genetic screening, and we've developed these molecular biomarkers that can tell whether you're part of that 10%. And so that's great, because now, you, before you even take the drug, you can figure out whether it'll work for you or not. If you're part of that 10%, you take the drug, and if you don't, you won't. That's great, except that what you've just done is to kill 90% of the market for this drug company. And so the possibility of developing biomarkers that will reduce the patient population of various different drugs have really changed the economics of the pharma industry. And as a result, the, the risks, not to mention the complexities, have grown tremendously even just over the past decade. And if you take that and couple it with the additional uncertainty due to the financial crisis and general market conditions, you can see why money is leaving the space. In fact, we argue that traditional forms of financing, venture capital, private equity, and public equity are not ideal. And uh, to Stu Meyer's point about the no notion of corporate governance, it turns out that in this case, because of the drug development process, because of the fact that there are three key characteristics of the pharma industry, A, it costs a lot of money to develop a drug, B, it takes a long time, and C, the probability of success is quite low, those three characteristics actually make both public equity and private equity less than ideal for financing. 
So what do you do about it? Well, my co-authors and I, what we're proposing is that financial engineering may actually offer a solution. In particular, what we're proposing is to apply basic portfolio theory as well as securitization to the drug development process. Now, uh, most of you, I think, are familiar with both of these concepts, so there's nothing new here. Really, the, the, the novelty is the application. But you might be a little bit suspicious because, as you know, securitization was at the heart of the financial crisis in terms of the, uh, all the various different securities, CDO, CDO squareds, and so on, that were issued. So let me talk a bit about the financial crisis because that's really what gave us the idea that this might actually work. Um, and I'm not going to take you through various different narratives of the financial crisis. You probably heard more than you ever want to hear about that at this point. But when I talk about the financial crisis to our MBA students, I do that with uh, one chart and a, a very simple one, which is U.S. real home price index from 1890 to 2012. So first, let me show you uh, what population has been in the United States uh, over the last uh, 100 years or so. We've definitely grown uh, as a country. We've got 330 million people right now. And so you would expect that you know, housing has become a more important part of uh, our country and our economy. Here are uh, real home prices over that period of time. And again, this is real, so it's taken into account inflation. We can compare over time. This is from 1890 to the peak of the housing market in 2006. Anybody notice anything unusual about this graph? <laughs> yeah, if you look at the last 10 years, clearly something happened. Now, of course, a number of things happened, but one of the most important things that happened was financial innovation, the uh, advent of securitization, CDOs, CDSs, and so on. And when you look at that, of course, you realize that uh, something really extreme uh, occurred in terms of the ability to channel money from global financial markets into U.S. residential real estate. And of course, it's had a not so happy ending over the course of the last uh, few years. We've come down quite a bit back to that steady state level. Now, how did this happen? Uh, I mean, uh, how, how could we have done this uh, in such an incredible scale? To give you a sense of the scale, if you look at the amount of debt that we issued that was related to mortgages, from 1996, uh, starting in 1996, we issued about $480 billion of mortgage-related debt. Just seven years later, from 1996 to 2003, that number grew from $480 billion to over $3 trillion. In 2003, we issued $3 trillion of mortgage-related debt in that one year. This is why around that time when Paul Krugman, the New York Times columnist and Nobel Prize winning economist, when he was asked to summarize the U.S. economy, he said, oh, it's very simple. We buy and sell each other homes using money borrowed from the Chinese. That's it. <laughs> it's pretty accurate. Now, what could possibly go wrong with this? Well, we, we know. We know what went wrong with it. But the bottom line is that it happened for a reason. And if you want to know how it could have happened, ask the question, well, who benefited? Who benefited from rising home prices and all of the attendant financial innovation that went along with it and drove it? And in alphabetical order, if you do an honest accounting of who benefited, well, the answer is pretty much everybody benefited. Not to the same degree. So obviously, some people benefited more than others. And uh, you know, the finger pointing and uh, you know, all of the, uh, the blame is, is being attributed at this as we speak. But the bottom line is that, as someone once said, a rising tide lifts all boats. Everybody benefited from this, which is how we had such a massive increase in home prices as well as uh, influx of capital. I think it was Warren Buffett who said, a rising tide may lift all boats, but it's only when the tide goes out that you see who's swimming naked. <laughs> and apparently a number of people were swimming naked. But there's a bigger theme behind all of this, which is that financial innovation is actually part and parcel of general innovation. And as we innovate in areas, in all areas of industry, we require the proper financial infrastructure to be able to support it. So you need private investment, but also you need the accounting, legal, regulatory structure, system, systemic stability, and most importantly of all, the proper design of securities to be able to incentivize people to engage in this kind of innovation. Incentives are critical throughout, and I think Stu's talk really highlights the importance of incentives in corporate governance. 
Now, the psychologists tell us that there are two ways to incentivize people. One is by fear. So we can scare people into action. If I built a large fire on this stage and smoke was billowing, I suspect I can motivate all of you to file out of this room rather quickly. The problem with fear is that it doesn't last. It is not possible to be fearful for very long. You will die if you live in a state of fear for any length of time. Greed, on the other hand, is very sustainable. <laughs> fear works fast, but greed lasts much longer. And by the way, I should mention that there's nothing that says that greed and altruism are necessarily incompatible. In fact, with all of this talk about sustainability, I would suggest to you that greed is more sustainable than fear. And so I want to point out that when you look at a chart like this, you shouldn't just shake your head and uh, think, you know, how stupid were we to be buying homes that we didn't need using money that we didn't have. When you look at this and you see what happened over the course of the 10 years, you should look at it now as a kind of a proof of concept of the amazing power of financial markets. In particular, I look at it as the financial equivalent of E equal MC squared. There is tremendous power locked up in financial markets. If we can only figure out how to tap those uh, uh, resources, there's enormous things that we can accomplish. If Warren Buffett is correct that, that uh, derivatives are financial weapons of mass destruction, I guess that makes uh, Bob Merton uh, Albert Einstein, which I think is quite appropriate. We remember that, that, that we, there may be tremendous destructive power in, in uh, uh, fission, but there's also tremendous possibilities. So let me describe to you what one of those possibilities are. What if we could focus this enormous power for good? Not to say that real estate is evil, but suppose that we could take this expertise and channel these resources towards social priorities. Well, let me make a rather bold claim. And the claim is that within the next two decades, with the proper financial engineering, I claim that we can solve society's biggest challenges, in particular, cancer, the energy crisis, and global warming. We can solve all three of those problems with the right financial structure. And conversely, without the financial structure in place, it would be impossible to deal with these issues. Now, you might ask how. And usually at this time, I've run out of time, but I see that I uh, didn't time my talk correctly, so I, I have a few extra minutes. So I've got to give you an answer. The short answer is I have no idea how. But I think collectively, we can figure out how. Because these problems are way too big for any one or two people to understand and to be able to solve. But with the proper incentives, we can tap the wisdom of crowds to figure out how. So let me try to give you some sense of how we might do this with respect to cancer. I'm going to ask you to think about whether you would be willing to invest in developing a cancer drug. And this is a caricature of the industry, so I'm being relatively simplistic just in the interest of time, and I'll be happy to talk about uh, details afterward. But the typical cancer drug development program is something that would cost about $200 million just in out-of-pocket costs for researching one given compound from the beginning of the preclinical phase all the way through phase one, phase two, phase three to FDA approval. And that process will take approximately 10 years and for oncology, the probability of success for any given compound is about 5%. Large amount of money, long time period, low probability of success. How many people would be interested in investing in a project like this? Show of hands. Wow, nobody. Do you see why money is leaving the space? This is a problem. Well, usually when I teach MBA students, I'll have one or two of them that will raise their hands and say, well, wait a minute, you know, you didn't tell us what the rate of return is. And uh, interesting that, you know, here on Canary Wharf, none of you asked what the rate of return is. Maybe you already know what the rate of return is. Um, well, let me tell you what the rate of return is. For most people, it doesn't matter, because with a 5% success rate and a $200 million initial investment and a 10-year horizon, they just are not interested. But if you're so lucky as to develop a successful cancer compound, it turns out that the annual earnings for such a compound is about $2 billion. And by the time you get it approved, you have about a 10-year patent life on it. 
So the cash flows are $2 billion a year from years 11 to years 20, which gives you an NPV in year 10 of about $12.3 billion using a 10% cost of capital, which is the typical cost of capital for the biopharma industry. $200 million in year zero, $12.3 billion in year 10 in NPV with 5% probability, and with 95% probability, nothing. So that gives you a 5% probability of a compound rate of return of 51% per year for the first 10 years, and minus 100% with 95% probability. For those of you who are quantitative investment professionals, let me compute the expected return and standard deviation for you. This is an investment that has a 12% expected return and a standard deviation of 423.5%. <laughs> right now, how many of you would be interested in investing in this? Still nobody, okay. Well, suppose instead of investing in one of these, you could invest in 150 of these. How would you like that? You might argue, why would you want that? If you don't want one, certainly 150 is not going to be any better, right? That's like the, the, the joke about the two women in the Catskills at some mediocre resort. One woman says to the other, the food here, it's horrible. The first woman says, yes, I know, in such small portions. Why do you want more of something that you don't want at all? <laughs> well, it turns, out, it, it turns out that if you could actually invest in 150 of them, the economics change considerably. Suppose that you had $30 billion and you could invest in 150 of these simultaneously. And further assume that these 150 drug development projects were independently and identically distributed. Well, if that were the case, then it turns out that diversification works its magic as we know. And now, instead of a 12% expected return and a 423.5% standard deviation, you now have a 12% expected return and a 35% standard deviation investment. How many people would be interested in having a piece of this fund here? Okay, a few more hands. But it gets better. Now, how do we raise $30 billion? Well, it turns out that if we actually had 150 IID projects, the amount of risk reduction that has occurred purely through diversification allows us to raise debt to finance this. How much debt? Well, what's the probability of at least two successes out of 150 trials? We can figure that out pretty easily. Given it's IID and given it's a 5% probability of success, 150 of them will give you two, at least two successes with probability 99.59%. It's a simple binomial distribution. 99.59% probability of at least two successes. 150 shots on goal will give you a much higher expected ra a, a, a success rate, not surprisingly. With at least two successes, what does that mean? That means that we have at least two projects worth $12.3 billion, which means that with 99.59% probability, we've got $25 billion of NPV in year 10, which means we can issue up to $25 billion in face value of debt and have a default rate of 1 minus 99.59%, which would put you in between the single A and double A category. And with a double A yield of about 4%, that gives us a, a net present value of about 16 $0.7 billion in year zero. We can issue $16.7 billion of high quality debt to finance this $30 billion fund. And if you allow me to use all the tricks of the trade, the CDOs, CDSs, and all of what we learned through the housing crisis, we can do even better than that. Now, uh, in a paper that uh, was published uh, just last year in Nature Biotech, my co-authors and I, we actually run a simulation using historical cancer uh, compound databases where we don't assume IID. We look at historical correlations among publicly traded cancer companies, and we look at phase transitions from phase one to phase two and so on in that database. And using these uh, very crude back-of-the-envelope simulation, we're able to show that if you have a 
a tranched structure where you have a 5% senior tranche and you have an 8% junior tranche and you have an equity tranche, you can get rates of return of on the order of 9 to 11% for the equity tranche, which is pretty decent for a $30 billion fund. It's not going to excite venture capitalists, but for pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, and other investors, this is a very interesting possibility. Now, by the way, we, uh, I want to mention that we also uh, have software that we developed that run the simulation. We put that software on our website. It's written in both MATLAB and R. Anybody who's interested is welcome to it. It's got an open source license. We're hoping that you take it, modify it, redistribute it, steal it, and use it, and hopefully get rich on it. Because if you do, maybe we'll cure cancer. Now, is this realistic? Well, let me first talk about capacity. $30 billion is a lot of money, but frankly, the financial crisis has emboldened me, given that we spent $40 billion on General Motors, $120 billion on AIG. We spend billions of dollars all the time, no problem. $30 billion on cancer doesn't seem like a big deal. In fact, if you look at the size of the U.S. debt market in 2010, the U.S. bond market was $35 trillion, $35 trillion. Mutual funds, 12 trillion. Money market funds, 1 trillion. The, si the single Norwegian sovereign wealth fund, 537 billion. The California Public Employee Retirement System, 226 billion. And CalPERS is not looking for 30, 40% rates of return. In 2010, their target return was 8%, and that was just lowered last year to 7.5% return. That's right in the sweet spot of the cancer mega fund simulation that we performed. In contrast, in 2010, the size of the entire venture capital industry in the U.S., if you took all the venture funds across all the different industries and put them into a pot, you know how much that would be? $176 billion. There is no way you're going to get $30 billion from VCs for cancer. It's way too big. Now, with some imagination, my co-authors and I believe that this is achievable. And uh, let me give you a sense of what we mean by that. Imagine creating a $30 billion cure for cancer mega fund. Now, that's naive because we're not going to be able to cure cancer. We're going to be able to understand it and be able to deal with some of it. Cancer is not one disease. It's more like 200 different diseases. But nonetheless, for purposes of raising funds and focusing people's attention, cancer is an incredibly uh, natural starting point and one that we think can actually be quite successful. Imagine creating uh, an incredibly prestigious uh, board of, of advisors, both on the scientific front as well as on the business front. On the scientific front, imagine getting George Dimitri, Eric Lander, Bob Langer, Mark Levin, Frank McCormick, Phil Sharp, and Harold Varmus to be on the board. Those of you who are from the biopharma industry, you will recognize these names as the absolute pinnacle of leadership in, in that field. On the business side, imagine getting Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Jacob Goldfield, Bob Merton, Jim Simons, George Soros, and Bill Sharp. Now, these are extraordinarily busy and, uh, people that are unlikely to get involved in things that, that really aren't going to have an impact. For example, the folks in blue, uh, most of them have no idea who I am. And uh, certainly, if I call them to join this board, I doubt they would return my phone calls. The folks in green, most of them do know who I am which is why if I call them, I know that they won't return my phone calls. <laughs> but I guarantee you every single one of them will return your phone calls if you raise $30 billion. And it's not because of the money. The folks in blue, they couldn't care less about the money. They're not motivated by money. And the folks in green, they have all the money. But if you raise $30 billion, you can actually make a difference. And I believe that all of them will participate. Now imagine corporate pension funds, foundations, endowments, insurance companies investing in such a fund. In fact, in one of these, one of these uh, institutions, a cancer mega fund would be a natural hedge. What, what would that be? What kind of company would view this as a hedge? Well, insurance companies that are facing longevity risk, right? When you write an annuity, you're actually betting that the person's going to die sooner rather than later. So an insurance company can hedge that bet one of two ways. They can invest in carcinogens and try to kill you off sooner, <laughs> or they can invest in this and be able to counterbalance that. The pension funds should go short. What's that? The pension funds should go short. Well, they, they, they could, although if you take a look at the rates of return and what they're getting right now, I'm not sure that that would be a very smart strategy for them. But let's also focus on the retail side. 
imagine if you were thinking about investing money for your parents or children's uh, college education, retirement fund, whatever. How many of you would be willing to put $3,000 as a one-time investment in a cancer mega fund with these individuals running it? How many people would put $3,000 over the course of a 10-year period? Well, I only needed 8% of you to say yes, because there are 130 million households in the United States, and if I had 8% of them giving us $3,000, that's 30 billion right there. And then finally, imagine government tax incentives, credit enhancement, think Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac for cancer. There are all sorts of things that can be done with sufficient imagination. Now, uh, there are lots of challenges to this, of course, and many of these challenges my co-authors and I have no idea how to address because they have to deal with the underlying science and business of the biopharma industry. But we're convening a conference actually starting this Sunday where we're bringing together all of the various different stakeholders, oncologists, people from the FDA, investment bankers, investors, uh, to try to explore ways of actually making this a reality. So let me uh, conclude by pointing out that, you know, since 1971, we've had a war on cancer. And I'm not qualified to say whether we're winning or losing the war. There are arguments on both sides of that debate. But I would argue that war is the wrong metaphor because it's based on fear. I think what we ought to do is to focus instead on something much more sustainable, which is greed. Instead of declaring war on cancer, let's put a price tag on its head. And with sufficient scale, we can do well by doing good, particularly if we recognize the fact that finance doesn't always have to be a zero-sum game, as Stu Myers mentioned in his talk. You know, I, I want to be sensitive here because I realize that when you're dealing with cancer, you're talking about life and death. Uh, my mother died of cancer two years ago, so I, I get it. It's a, a very, very sensitive subject. And in the same breath, to mention these issues, as well as mentioning rates of return and in investments, seems, frankly, obscene and offensive. But the problem is that if we don't do that, if we don't focus on earning a decent rate of return for investors, we're not going to get $30 billion. There are many generous people out there. Many of you have donated generously to cancer funds. And foundations uh, and endowments obviously do a lot of good. But it's not enough. We're not going to be able to get $30 billion in that manner unless we're able to change the right financial structure in order to provide incentives for curing cancer. And with your help, we're hoping that we can make this a reality. I suspect that there are people in this room right now that have the wherewithal to either invest in something like this or to create a vehicle or to engage in the scientific endeavors to make this a reality. And we're hoping that we'll be able to get your help in doing this. Thank you. That's very interesting. I, I have a question. So at the moment, as you said, there is a lot of money going you know, in endowments or you know, from the public sector in this. So are you saying for this to be successful, effectively you need someone, effectively like a, a fund manager, or someone that actually allocates this money efficiently? So are you saying as a consequence that the money is going today in curing cancer effectively is not diversified enough or is not actually allocated efficiently? Right. It's diversification is the issue. And actually, in the industry, uh, based upon all the conversations that I've had with folks in pharma, the pharmaceutical companies recognize the fact that risks are too high. So they engage in a lot of M&A activity in order to try to, quote, de-risk their portfolio. In, in fact, if you look at pharma companies and their balance sheets, they have more than $30 billion right now in cash. And so at first, when I looked at that, I said, gee, why doesn't the pharma companies just do this? The reason they don't do this is they can't do this. The reason that they have the cash is precisely to offset the risks of their research portfolios. They have to leave it as cash. They can't invest it in risky early stage investments. So yes, I'm arguing that we need to have a separate vehicle, a new vehicle, a new business structure, a new corporate governance structure to deal with the challenges of drug development. years because yes after that you have you know, the cash flow coming from from the projects but before then yeah so uh, this is where we need the expertise of those who are are in the field so let me channel their expertise since I obviously am not uh, you know from the uh, the industry the business model that 
we've been discussing as pre preparations for the, uh, the conference, uh, which by the way, the website for the conference is cancerx.mit.edu, so you're welcome to take a look at that. The business model is to actually invest in a broad spectrum of assets, not just early stage, but also mid-stage and late stage. Late stage assets, if you invest, for example, in a phase three drug that's about to be approved or it's in, in the final stages of clinical trials, that can generate cash flows within a year. So by holding a portfolio of early stage and late stage, you can actually generate enough cash to pay the interest. That's one approach. The second approach is to use something that was used to great effect in the commercial mortgage-backed securities markets, which is to actually issue more debt than you need and create a reserve fund to, where the reserve would actually pay interest for the first two or three years. Now, when I first heard about this, I thought, surely this must be illegal, because you're basically asking bondholders to, to pay their interest early on. But it turns out, not only is it perfectly legal, but it's actually fairly standard in the commercial real estate market. And the reason is actually fairly straightforward. Bondholders need to have steady cash flows, and they recognize that you're basically borrowing from later cash flows to be able to move it back earlier. Whether you're issuing a larger amount of debt or not is not really material for them, as long as you fully disclose it. So those two methods, issuing uh, you know, a l little bit larger amount to, to pre-fund the first two or three years of interest payments, and then investing in a broad spectrum of assets can actually deal with cash flows in the early years. And then, of course, the later years, you can monetize your investments uh, fairly e easily. Yes. Oh, um, so who has the microphone? Yes. Yeah, hi. Um, how confident are you that there is the capacity out there in science for as many as 150 viable, valid projects that actually have as much as a 5% chance? Isn't there a risk that, in the same way that we stimulated people to, to lend, yeah. lend money to, in mortgages to people who had no chance of right. paying back this time, we're going to so, end up finan financing projects that really don't So that, that's a great question. Chance. And actually, that, that was the first question that, that I asked before going down this path. Um, now, maybe it's because I happen to be at MIT and uh, I'm surrounded by molecular biologists and cancer researchers that have way too many ideas and way too few research dollars. But certainly from my colleagues uh, at MIT, they tell me that there's tremendous capacity. Let me give you a, a sense of that. How many people in this room either have dealt with cancer directly or have dealt with cancer through somebody that they know and love? Well, I think your answer is right there. This is a really big challenge and there's tremendous interest in it. In terms of other forms of capacity, uh, the American Cancer Society has pointed out that the probability of somebody getting cancer in the US is one out of two if they're male and one out of three if they're female. There are apparently 800 cancer compounds that are waiting to be researched. It's a 20-year backlog by most estimates. And according to Nature magazine last year, there was a survey of PhDs that are being produced. And uh, the, the statistics are that there are way more PhDs being produced than there are jobs. There's a huge glut of PhDs. In fact, the, the area that has the most number of PhDs being produced without sufficient jobs is in the life sciences. So based upon all of the evidence that I can find, it seems like there's tremendous capacity and not nearly enough resources. And I think that the problem is this aspect of risk. If we can figure out a way to transfer risk to those who can actually bear it best, we can deal with some of that uh, capacity issue. I'm, 10 years ago, I did set up uh, with some MIT physics grads a company in the sector. And it looks like we probably are on the uh, lucky side of the probability scale. Uh, I just make two observations out of my own experience. First, uh, we should probably include the academics in uh, the benefits of uh, diversification. I'll give you one quick example. We had a professor with an amazing molecule. We are on the nuclear si side of the molecular medicine. And he had an amazing molecule, but then he was so tempted by publishing on, on uh, scientific magazines that uh, even if he had a contract with us, he just blew up this, this molecule by publishing a couple of articles, which basically means that after that, you just can't anymore a fine capital because you can't get a patent on something which is widely known. Yeah. So finding incentives to, for academics, maybe offering them too to participate in a big fund whereby on a singular basis you are probably m more likely to decide to have a couple of very nice uh, and maybe a promotion uh, in your academic world. But if you participate to the fund, you are more incentivized to give yeah. up that in exchange for a better return. The second very quick one is um, 
let's think about the fact that it's ju not just uh, uh, drugs for cure, also for diagnostics, where yeah. the actual odds may, may end up being better than in case of. Absolutely. So let me comment on your first point regarding academics. And there are two separate points uh, with regard to that. The first point is you're absolutely right that academics uh, and academic research is actually quite different from uh, drug development. Uh, in, in the same way that uh, academic finance uh, is very different from portfolio management. Uh, you know, it's not always the case that a brilliant finance professor is somebody that you want managing your 401k. Uh, and uh, so I, I think that um, you, know, you make a very important qualification there. However, I want to go one step farther and point out that as a result, the National Institutes of Health, which is the, the largest funder of academic research in this area, is not necessarily going to be able to cure cancer. That's not their role. They're trying to produce the best quality research, and they're very good at it. But winning a Nobel Prize is different from curing cancer, so we need to have a separate set of activities. But along those same lines, it, it is the case that academics have an incredibly important role to play. And where a new business structure can actually have tremendous impact is in allowing academics to participate without having to have them give up tenure, quit their jobs, and start up biotech companies. Because one of the things that, that I've learned uh, in my own business, as, as well as in, in looking at the uh, biotech industry, is that not all academics are good as business people. That, that they're, not all academics are good as CEOs. And they, they, they're brilliant, but they shouldn't necessarily be running a business. If you created a $30 billion mega fund, you could actually allow academics to contribute their intellectual property and have a chance of getting life-altering wealth without having to give up their careers. That's a new business model that doesn't yet exist. It's, think of it as a kind of a, a fund of funds or a multi-strategy fund for the biotech business. That's something that could transform it. The second point you made was about diagnostics. You're absolutely right. The diagnostics have a higher probability of success, and so that's something that you can definitely include in the portfolio. One thing I didn't have time to mention was orphan diseases. Orphan diseases, by definition, are diseases that affect less than 200,000 patients. It turns out that orphan diseases are changing the way that we think about the drug, uh, the drug industry's economics in, in some very, very positive ways for finance, because it turns out that, by definition, an orphan disease tends to be uncorrelated with each other. So that IID assumption that I made actually works pretty well for orphan diseases. You have smaller patient populations, so it doesn't cost $200 million. It's maybe $25 million to develop a drug. And the efficacy is, is much higher with orphan diseases. And it turns out that the success rates is not 5%. It's more like 25 to 50%. So there, you can get a, an orphan disease mega fund that's very attractive with only 10 or 15 projects, not 150. Isn't it true that to some degree in the uh, healthcare industry, it's actually much more profitable to treat a disease long term, moderately expensively, like chemotherapy, let's say, versus actually curing it cheaply? And it seems like, I think cancer is not the only case, uh, but a lot of the healthcare industry seems to be um, disincentivized to actually cure a disease. Um, it's kind of like a Clay Christensen, um, um, inventor's dilemma, right? If you right. actually invent something, you obsolete your existing cash flows. So uh, you're absolutely right. That there are all sorts of twisted incentives in the healthcare industry, and I'm no expert on the healthcare industry, so I'm not qualified to comment on that. Uh, however, if you look at the very basic economics of disease, apart from the incentives that need to be addressed, it seems like there should be a way to figure out how to cure certain diseases if you're willing to pay for it. And if you look at the cost benefit to society as a whole, it's a matter of trying to find the right structure. So, so to give you an example, breast cancer, there are 230,000 cases of breast cancer every year. 30,000 women die of breast cancer every year. Suppose you can cure breast cancer. Suppose you actually develop a cure, something that, I don't know, would cost a million dollars to treat once and for all, and you're done with that. Well, there are different ways of splitting up that million dollars. Maybe it's developing a drug that you have to take every year for the rest of your life, in which case you effectively are capitalizing that million dollars over the course of the patient's life. But the question is, is it worthwhile to develop that drug? And my view is that 30,000 deaths a year, it seems like you ought to be able to justify the appropriate economics to be able to structure a contract to do that. How you structure that contract, I have no idea. I'll leave it to Professor Myers to tell us how. <laughs>
But the point is that if you look at the basic economics, it, it, should, it should be possible to, to get it done. Great. Thank you very much uh, for your talk today. Um, I have a question on when the world comes together and puts its mind to something, it has been shown that we can raise such large amounts of dollars, for example, $20 billion for the Global Fund to fight HIV, TB, and malaria, or over $10 billion for the Global Alliance for Vaccines, mm -hmm. which $6 billion have been raised from bonds. And I was wondering for two questions. One, what lessons can we learn for the Cancer Mega Fund based on the funds or the donor philanthropy that's been raised from infectious diseases. And secondly, for your cash flows of the $2 billion expected blockbuster returns and revenues for the drug, what kinds of incentives can you build in for developing countries mm -hmm. who don't see price points such as the US can be sustained in their markets? And how can we get those countries involved as the disease burden will spread there as well? Yeah, those are great questions. And I'm afraid I don't have very good answers other than to acknowledge that uh, there are some very, very tricky uh, issues that have to be navigated. Let me explain why. When you start talking about philanthropy, you're talking about a completely different set of goals than what we're focusing on, which is generating a decent rate of return for investors. And the reason that we were very concerned about bringing into the discussion philanthropy is because as soon as you muddy the waters with mixed incentives, you create uh, a disincentive for large investors to get involved, right? When you, when you talk to the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund and you say, you know, this fund that we're raising, a $30 billion fund, in addition to trying to make money for investors, it's also got a social mission of curing disease. As soon as you say that to them, they'll say, well, you know, thank you very much. Talk to our foundation folks. I, I don't want to waste my time. I need to think about how to make money for my investors. And so we're very nervous about bringing into the discussion uh, you know, issues that are, uh, uh, that are not related to purely investment rates of return. However, I do think that there's an important role for foundations and nonprofits to play, which is to think about using their money not for directly supporting cancer research or, or infectious diseases, but rather use it with some financial engineering in mind. In particular, if foundations were to take their money that they're spending now on supporting cancer research and use it to provide guarantees, like a credit default swap on the senior tranche of one of these uh, uh, securitized uh, structures, they can actually pull a lot more money into the space. And given that they don't care about profits anyway, it doesn't matter whether or not uh, you know, it, 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 they succeed or fail, that's even better. It actually will supercharge you know, this kind of private sector uh, uh, funding vehicle. Now, I'm not arguing that they, they shouldn't focus on, on profit and loss, but the point is that if their mandate is to generate uh, more cures for different kinds of disease, this may be a more efficient way of doing it, is for them to provide the kind of guarantees and then to allow the underlying investors to focus on uh, getting a decent rate of return. Last question. increasing the size of the fund and buying uh, royalties. Yeah. You know, offering yes. drugs or other yeah. portfolios. Absolutely. In, 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 in fact, part of the structure does contemplate uh, uh, buying drug royalties, in, including uh, a business model that was developed uh, in 1996, uh, Royalty Pharma. Royalty Pharma is a dr drug royalty investment company based in New York, and so their business model is very much part of what the mega fund needs to be. OK. Yeah, and the other point is, uh, is that there is uh, a company, uh, a fund that was established that relatively similar Mm -hmm. It's called the former uh, Microsoft scientist for intellectual ventures. Oh, yep. They raised about $8 billion that way. Yep. So you may want to meet Great. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'll definitely look into that. Great. Thank you.